Yeah, hello and welcome back everybody. Here is now the long promised new um, chapter with some additional theory or some new stuff after the exercise cases. Today we are talking about a cross-border sale of goods in the EU. This is only the first of several lectures. Let's have a look where we are within the overall chapter cross-border transaction. We are here after discussing exports and imports now, cross-border sales within the EU. And the first thing you need to know, that is the basic logic. You know that within the EU, the value-added tax rules are strongly harmonized. So there are many um, identical rules, but the EU states still have different tax rates. What does that mean for cross-border trade? Well, um, you remember that the basic principle of value-added tax is there must be no distortion of competition. There must be neutrality for competition. Um, that directly led us to the consequence that if you have um, two states with different tax rates, the tax should go to the country of destination. So if the customer is French, then every good he buys should be taxed under French law at the French rates, so you have neutrality. However, if the customer is German, every good which is sent to Germany should be taxed in Germany. So the taxation in the country of destination, that is still a principle which should be regarded as absolutely vital when you design a system for cross-border trade in the EU. Now, um, what is uh, very special in the EU? Um, the problem in the EU is you have abolished the border controls between Germany and France, France and Spain and all these states. The goods can freely flow over the border. And so how can you now ensure a taxation in the country of destination when you can no longer have checks at the border. How can such a system be established that, let's say, every good which a German sells to France is taxed in France and not in Germany? And how can you establish such a system with the least possible bureaucratic burden for the people who are involved to do the transaction? That is the basic question which the legislator had to answer already in 1992 or 1993 when they removed the border controls. Now, um, the EU found a three-step solution depending on the circumstances under which that cross-border sale of a good happens. There is first an optimal, a best solution, which is really combined with the least bureaucratic burden for the people involved. A second best version, which applies if the best version cannot function or cannot be expected to function in the concrete case. And there is a third a default option, which takes place if neither solution one nor solution three, uh, two can be expected to work properly. Well, this is now rather abstract. But you can already keep in mind that when you test an EU cross-border delivery case, you will have to make a three-step test. Does the best solution work? Then I solve it according to the rules of that best solution. Does it not work? Um, where you can see that from will be shown to you quickly and soon. Not quickly, but soon. Then you turn to the second best solution. And if you find out, okay, the technical conditions for that are not fulfilled, then you pass on to solution number three, the um, default or catch all the rest solution. Well, that is very abstract. So let us begin in um, understanding the system. Let us first think about how might the optimal, the best potential solution within an area of two, three, or 27 states without border control, how might such a best solution look like if you want to achieve a taxation in the country of destination? Well, 
Let's look to an example. If a good is delivered from Germany to France, then the principle clearly says the tax should be paid to France. Now, the question which we have to solve under the optimal solution or under every solution is, okay, who should pay the tax to France? It must be somebody. So we need to decide who shall make the payment. In a classical expert situation, you had three potential, uh, uh, three persons involved. You had the seller, you had the buyer, you had the customs officer. And when you had a border control, it was clear the customs officer knew everything. The customs officer was at place when the border was crossed. It was the best and simplest rule to say it is a customs officer who has to do all the stuff. He assesses and collects the tax, everything's fine. Now, within the EU, you don't have the customs officer anymore, so you have only the seller and the buyer left. So, you need to decide who of the two should pay to France, in our example. And now, it is probably not a very strange idea to see who can read French texts forms better, a French buyer or a German seller. Our first idea is naturally a French buyer probably knows more about French law, French tax forms and French language than a German. And the French authorities will also be more happy to address a French person for tax payments than to make a cross-border request to Germany, hey, there is a German who owes us taxes. So under the perspectives of the people involved, it's the easiest solution to make the French buyer the taxpayer. So that automatically leads us to the basic idea behind the best solution in the, inter, uh, in the internal or single market. The best solution will be the tax goes to the country of destination and the taxpayer shall be the buyer. That is plain logic as you see here. Well, we need later to think about how we um, write rules which transform that into law. But the basic idea is simple as we heard it just now. Now, unfortunately, this first, the best idea does not work with all kind of potential bias. <laughs> you can, when you look to bias, distinguish three categories of bias. First, the full experts, those who know about value added tax rules, who are able to fill out a VAT tax return sheet, who, um, are familiar with VAT declarations, those people who are great. These are usually the entrepreneurs which are regularly taxed. Every entrepreneur in France who is regularly taxed, not a small entrepreneur, not tax examined or so, hands in a tax declaration to the French authorities regularly, knows how to fill out these things. So. These are the buyers when you, where you can simply say, okay, fill out an additional line. How much stuff did you buy this month from Germany? It's so easy. So you can always ask the full experts, could you please declare your purchases from, Germ from Germany and from other member states? That would be great. So that is simple. Now you have in contrast to the full experts, the other extreme, the full idiots, those persons from whom you can never realistically expect that they could ever fill out a VAT declaration, those persons who probably do not know even that VAT exists or they know about the word but nothing about the rules, you couldn't teach them the rules because they are too stupid. Um, so the full idiots you can't use them as tax buyers, uh, taxpayers. It's completely impossible. So if this is completely impossible, then it's clear the best version 
buyer is the taxpayer, doesn't work with these people. Now, between the two extremes, the full experts and the full idiots, you have naturally something in between. By the way, who is the typical um, full idiot? The private person. The average natural person running around in the streets has no idea about tax law. Um, you cannot expect from a retired 95-year-old um, tenant in a room having dementia to declare his purchases from Italy from last month. He probably doesn't remember. He doesn't have a bookkeeping. So with a private person, you cannot, you can also not control and check the declarations which they make. So with a private person, that's the standard example of a full idiot. There you are fully lost. No chance to make them a taxpayer. Now you and me probably think we are natural persons and we know a bit about value added tax. So we could perhaps fill out a VAT declaration, but the FISC cannot rely on that. First, we are a minority, one or two in the thousands who know about value added tax as a natural person, not having the enterprise. Second, when somebody would accuse us of not paying our taxes correctly, although we know about value added tax, we could easily talk ourselves out of the matter. Well, I passed several exams, but uh, I was always bad at value added tax. I only passed with good knowledge of income tax and corporation tax. Well, Mr. X, I can show you, you pass, you, you solved the VAT task in an exam very well. And you could still say, yes, I had a very good neighbor in that exam and I had very good eyes. Uh, so private persons are completely out of consideration when it comes to who could be the taxpayer when he or she buys something. Okay, so category number three. Between the two extremes, you always have something in the middle. Not the full idiots and not the full experts, the half experts, those who are halfway between experts and idiots, those who do not yet know the rules, but who could learn them, those people who not yet have hand in a tax declaration, at least not a regular one, but who could learn it and whose tax declaration you could also control and check if it's the truth or not. So those people who have the bookkeeping. So which people are these people in between the two extremes? Um, first, small entrepreneurs. If you are an entrepreneur, you are subjected to value the tax law. Um, if your turnover will exceed certain thresholds, you will be forced to learn value added tax or to contact somebody, a tax advisor, who does it for you. So you have a basic knowledge about how things are done. Um, and you, you are supposed that you are able to learn it in the long run when your business gets higher, better, greater, bigger. Um, so a small entrepreneur is somebody who does not yet hand in a tax declaration, but whom you reasonably can assume to be able that he or she can learn it in the long run. So you could take these people as taxpayers if you want to. Then there are some entrepreneurs who up to now only make tax-free output. So they do not have to hand in a tax declaration now because they are uh, making sales, but every single sale is tax-free. Um, so until now, they are not familiar with the regular rules, but they could learn it. They have a bookkeeping, they are entrepreneurs. Uh, they have probably a tax advisor who tells them, yes, you are completely tax-free, forget about value added tax at the moment. So they already have the information near at hand, and they could have somebody who says, okay, now you did something which forces you to hand in that VAT declaration. Certain farmers are subjected to a special tax regime under value at the tax, so they 
Now, I'm not familiar with the legal rules for the regular tax declaration, but they are entrepreneurs. They own a business. They have advisors. They need already to hand in other tax declarations for businesses, for example, for income tax or corporation tax. So they have a bit of understanding of bureaucratic and legal procedures. They could learn it. And last but not least, juridical persons, let's say a registered club, an EV, or a city authority, or something else. A legal person always has a bookkeeper, where they register the money which comes in and the money which flows out. And if the money flows out, you, you must register for what you paid it out. So if you purchase something, you need to register that. So you could check what these people did, the juridical persons. And last but not least, whoever um, works for a juridical person and does the bookkeeping must have a basic understanding of legal rules, of bookkeeping rules and of taxes. So there is also, if you have a juridical person, there is somebody with knowledge near at hand whose knowledge the juridical person could use. So these are the four categories of persons which are in between the two extremes, between the full idiot and the full expert. So you could classify this group as the half experts or half idiots. Now it's clear that half experts sounds better. Now, uh, and also the VAT, um, law usually doesn't talk about experts and idiots but the experts would be usually called the entrepreneurs at least the regular ones so somebody some years ago coined the term at least in german literature half entrepreneurs these are not people who are half an entrepreneur they are halfway between the entrepreneur who knows the rules and the person who has no understanding of the rules at all that explains that that term. Okay, what do we do with these half experts? The people who don't know the rules, but um, who could learn them? Well, think about it. Imagine you are a medical doctor and you have all tax free output. Not a single euro has to be um, declared in the VAT declaration until now. Now you buy for 10 euros something from Spain for your practice. Now imagine if for that purchase of 10 euro, you would have to hand in a German tax declaration. I am a German buyer. I bought something from Spain and I have to declare this transaction in my tax declaration. So you would have to hand in a tax declaration just with a single line for a tax payment of 1 euro 90. 10 euro net acquisition price, 1 euro 19 is at the moment German tax. That would um, cause a tax advisor to act for you. He would charge you fees. The fees would probably be 100 euro or more, and that only for a tax of 1 euro 90. So that is rather intolerable. You can't really demand from people to hand in a tax declaration an additional one which they until now don't need to make for such a small amount. And that gives you the way to understand what the legislator decided here. Legislator just said, okay, the, the half entrepreneurs will be declared taxpayers, not if they have a small amount of purchases, not for 10 euro. But imagine the medical doctor buys from a Spanish seller, a Picasso painting for 4 million euro and hangs it up in the waiting room of his practice. By the way, nobody would ever do this, but imagine this. Now we would say, if somebody spends so much money on purchases from Spain, that person also can pay the small fees to um, hand in an additional tax declaration for that. So you would make the status of these people dependent on how much they buy not in a single purchase but during the year if somebody makes a million of 10 euro purchases that is enormous amounts of money 
So you would say, okay, if somebody buys small items, but for 10 million, then the amount of tax would be 1,900,000, and that justifies to demand a tax declaration, whereas one single purchase of 10 euro does not justify such a bureaucratic um, monstrosity. Good. So when we want to find out if the best solution does the country of destination get the tax, and is the buyer declared the taxpayer? If that back solution will be applied, we just need to know which category of person the buyer is. The buyer is a regularly taxed entrepreneur. In such a case, the buyer will always have to pay the tax on the cross-border transaction. We call it then an intra-community acquisition because he buys something. So buying turns him into a taxpayer or buying is here the taxable transaction. So the intra-community acquisition will then be declared taxable in the country of destination. The buyer will have to pay. As the buyer is regularly taxed and already hands in a tax declaration, it's clear that you don't need to give them a threshold. Already for one euro purchased from France, a German, who already hands in the tax declaration can also declare the one euro per trace with 19 cents of tax because it does not make an additional tax declaration necessary. It's just filling out an additional line. It will not even increase the fees which a tax advisor charges you. It will not considerably uh, increase the uh, bureaucratic burdens in your bookkeeping department. Everything will be totally fine. So if your buyer is regularly taxed, then it's a clear thing. You choose him as a taxpayer and you apply the best possible solution. You say the buyer is taxpayer and we call it um, an intra-community acquisition. Number two, is the buyer a private person? In such a case, the buyer never has to pay intra-community acquisition tax because the buyer is too stupid and the buyer cannot be chosen. In that case, you have to pass over to solution number two, the second best solution, which we learn about later. And if the buyer is a half entrepreneur, then you will just say, okay, let's look to how much does this buyer purchase during the year. So you grant them a threshold. Um, if you buy more than this threshold, you will be classified into an acquisition taxpayer. However, if you make small purchases only, you don't need to act as a taxpayer. Um, you can, because that is just, let's say, a favor done to you, that you are not classified as a taxpayer for small purchases. If you are really keen on learning about VAT rules and you are an half entrepreneur, you can opt for becoming a taxpayer already from the first euro onwards. It might simplify your life. It might be that you want to learn about the VAT rules of your own country. You want to hand in a tax declaration once in your lifetime, so you could opt for it. But what's clear, a private person, a non-entrepreneur, a full idiot can not even opt. Because if a full idiot says, I want to hand in a tax declaration, this tax declaration is probably completely wrong, or there is no bookkeeping where you could check the contents if it's plausible. So regularly taxed entrepreneurs are always in for acquisition tax. Half entrepreneurs, there it depends on how much they buy in a given period of time, probably in a calendar year, or if they want to become taxpayers. And the private person is completely out. Good. Let's go on. What do you need to write into the law if the best solution um, can be chosen? First, in the country of destination, you need a rule that now not selling, but buying goods is taxable. Naturally, only under the condition that this good comes from another EU come, a country in the inland during a delivery. 
That rule indeed can be found. It's the rule that intra-community acquisition of goods is taxable. You find it in 1.1 number 5 of the Umsatzsteuergesetz. And now in the country where the good comes from, you need an additional rule to avoid smuggling. You must oblige the deliverer to prove in his home country, or at least better in the country where the good has been before, that this good really left the country to another EU country, and that there the buyer pays the tax. Because if you do not oblige people to prove that, then they would all sell the goods undercover in the darkness of the night in the backyard of their firm to, pass, to, to buy passing people free of tax and would just say to the fiscal office, hey, what do you want? I always sell my goods to people in other EU states and I, well, I can't prove it. Um, there is no legal basis for demanding a proof. So you need to subject these sellers to a burden of proof rule. Um, so what you do is you establish the regular rule, whoever is an entrepreneur and sells things is taxable with the delivery in the country where the good started to be transported to the customer. So in the country where the good was last seen. Um, so when a good goes away from the enterprise, this is a taxable transaction. And taxable means you have to pay apart from the cases where you can prove that you are free of tax. So the next step will then be, okay, dearest deliverer, if you can prove to us that you send the good to another EU state and that the buyer was there, the taxpayer, and you can give us a name and the proofs, then you naturally don't need to pay. So the best solution requires two legal rules. First, in the country of destination, a rule which says the buyer has to pay for the purchase, one, one, number five. And in the country of origin, where the good comes from, a rule which says the deliverer is taxable, but will be free of tax if the deliverer can prove to us what happened to the good, that it went to another U state and will be taxed there. So we have a logical system. Okay. Now, um, best work does not work, for example, if we have a private buyer. So we need to um, look for a second best solution. What can we do in the constellations where the buyer is not able to pay taxes under the expectations of the law? What second best can do, solution can we choose? Look again at the situation. The, the tax should go to the country of destination. We know the persons who are involved in the whole transaction. That was the customs officer. He's gone and dead. There is no customs officer. You can't take him. The buyer is the second person involved, but the buyer has been re uh, identified as a person who is not able to fulfill tax declaration duties, who is left over than the seller only the seller. So the logic says, if we have an unfit buyer and we want to have taxes paid to the country of destination, then we must decide the seller must be forced to pay taxes to the country of destination. So here now a German seller must be forced to pay taxes in France. The underlying idea is then, okay, an entrepreneur, even if it's German, has still a better chance um, to work himself or herself into French tax declarations and French law than a person who is a private person from France. And the seller has a bookkeeping and can be checked. A private person could never be checked. So that is why we decide now second best solution seller should be made taxpayer in the country of destination where he or she probably doesn't live. So that's a bureaucratic monstrosity naturally. You need to learn now the tax law of a foreign country. Under which solution, uh, circumstances does also this solution not work? The first condition is evident. The seller can only apply the solution 
Seller can only pay taxes in France if he or she knows that the good goes to France. That is only possible if the seller sends the good there himself or at least is involved in the organization of the transport. If the customer shows up in your shop, buys a bottle of beer, says, hello, I'm French and I'm going, then you never know if the bottle of beer will be drunken in Germany, in Belgium, on the journey home or in Paris. You never know if that French customer doesn't have an aunt in Cologne and gives her the bottle of beer as a present. So you don't know for certain about the fate of that good. And you can't demand a private person for proof. You all know a private person usually has a very decent idea on taxation. If lying helps or lie. So they will tell you something, uh, a fairy tale, um, in order to avoid taxation. So if the buyer shows up and takes the good home, you don't know about the fate of the good. You don't know where it goes to, so you can't pay to the country of destination. So first condition for a second best solution is it can only apply if the seller sends the good to the country of destination, otherwise not. And the second uh, condition is uh, you cannot really expect from a German deliverer to work himself or herself into French tax law learn French tax declarations, um, obtain a French taxpayer's identification number just for one euro. So there must be a threshold there. As this is now the threshold applicable to deliverers, it's called delivery threshold. In former times, that was a threshold set for every country. Um, so you could deliver up to 35,000 euros into France, French private persons, and 35,000 to Belgian private persons, because every threshold was uh, designed um, for each country. And the idea was, naturally, the French declaration duty is only triggered if you sell much to France, and the Belgian only if you pay much to Belgium. Now, in the time of online shops and internets getting more and more important, um, states found out this is too much distortion for competition still. If people can send goods to private customers in our country up to 35,000 or so. So one agreed on a compromise. Selling goods to private customers triggers tax ideally directly. Mm, but to make the bureaucratic burden bearable, one decided that you can hand in the tax declaration for these transactions, which you made with Bulgarian, Belgian, um, Danish, French, Spanish customers, to your home tax office in your own language. Um, so you only need to know about the tax base and the tax rate in the foreign country. And you have to declare that to your own fiscal office on an extra sheet of paper or extra electronic form. And then they collect the money and hand it over to the fiscal administrations of the countries of destination. Um, this is naturally also an additional bureaucratic procedure so one said, okay, we are not going to force people into that um, joint tax declaration for all deliveries for private customers in other member states, if it's only for one euro, because a tax advisor also needs to work himself or herself into that specific procedure. They will charge you some extra um, charges for that. Your bookkeeping needs some adjustments. Uh, that should not be enforced for 10 euro uh, but naturally, once you are using this uh, procedure, you can use it for every sale. And so the idea was, okay, we set a threshold for 10,000. If you sell less than 10,000 euro um, in goods or services to private persons from other member states, then this one-stop shop uh, procedure, declaration procedure, is not forced on you. 
then the second best solution is not enforced because then they say it's too costly for you. You can renounce on the threshold if you want to stop. So let us um, underline that last information again. In order to facilitate your job to declare your deliveries to private persons and other member states of the EU according to their tax law, one created the possibility to hand in the tax declaration for all these distance selling transactions because distance selling is the newly coined official name for this second best solution where you deliver um, goods cross-border into another EU state to a private customer or to a buyer who does not pay acquisition tax. Um, they allowed you to hand that in in a single tax declaration in your own member state. And your own member state then processes the information, uh, collects the money and hands over the money to each individual member states where the customers are. This procedure is um, named the one shop stop or one stop shop system. That is, you can deal with all the tax obligations for all the countries in a single shop, that is, in a single fiscal office, namely your home state's fiscal office. So that is where the name comes from. Well, again, if we look to that second best solution, uh, we clearly know now the requirements. The seller should be made taxpayer in the country of destination. How can we now make this result? Um, how can we transform it into the language of the VAT Act? Which rules are necessary? Uh, where do we need to modify rules? You remember when the buyer was um, declared taxpayer, we had to add a number which says the buyers purchases from other member states are a taxable transaction. What do we need for um, the result seller becomes taxable in the country of destination? Well, if you look to the standard rule one, one number one in the USDG, you see it's nearly fitting to the case. The seller is an enterprise. Um, he or she acts within the enterprise activities. Uh, consideration is demanded because you sell for a price. It's a delivery, so four out of five um, criteria still apply correctly. The only criterion which deviates, which does not yet fit, is the place of delivery. Under the regular rule, the place of delivery is where the delivery, the movement of the goods toward the customer starts. Three, six. And that leads to country of origin. That is not the result which you want to know. So it would be sufficient to have a good rule, which can be used just to change the place of delivery rule in these cases, which we have here. So to make a rule which says the place of delivery in a case of the second best solution, in the case of distance selling, to private customers in other EU states is simply shifted to the place where the good ends up at the end of the movement. And this rule indeed exists. It is placed in German law in paragraph 3c of the USDG. So you can so make that easy. When you have the second best solution, Use one, one, number one, and keep in mind the place will be shifted to the place where the good ends up at the end, uh, and that is in 3C1. We have already short time spoken for um, or on the other paragraphs of 3C. They have similar place shifting rules in cases of importation, um, and also similar OS declaration schemes sometimes. Um, we are not going to concentrate much on this now. The uh, threshold rule that this OS 
procedure is only triggered if you sell for more than 10,000 euro for in the way of distance selling to private customers in other EU states. However, it does only apply for intercommunity distance sales. You find this threshold in 3C4 USDG and it says, I only apply for intra-EU cases. Um, there are some special constellations where this distance selling rule does not um, apply in its pure form. That is the delivery of new vehicles, cars, for example, ships and others. The delivery of goods which still have to be assembled or installed in the place where they end up because then you don't have a cross-border movement. The finished product only begins to exist at the place in the other country. So the product which the customer ordered does not really cross, cross the border. So that is not our case. And there is also the delivery of second-hand goods. Uh, for them, there is a special uh, taxation scheme, the so-called margin scheme for second-hand goods which um, does not work if you would apply the distance selling rules. Um, so, well, that's the second best rule. And now if that second best solution, so the distance selling does not work, let's think about the alternatives which our legislators still have. Um, the reasons why it might not be applicable is the seller does not know where the good goes to because he doesn't send it there himself or bring it there himself or the seller is still below the threshold of these two reasons might exist and then let's think what might be our step number three the default solution well let's think about again about the opportunities possibilities which you have um, you have the customs officer, you have him no longer. You have the seller. Well, the seller um, is out because you said second best solution, seller can't pay to the country of destination. So until then we have country of destination and either the buyer as a, as a taxpayer or the seller as a taxpayer. Now we have used them both up. Both can't act as taxpayers in the country of destination. Then you have only one possibility left. Take the seller and the country of origin. So the default um, situation, the default solution is just, if you don't have solution one or two working, then just treat the case as an inland case. Ignore the fact that the good was sold into another EU case, uh, EU country then. So, um, no tax exemption and um, simple inland case. So if a French private customer shows up in a German shop and buys a good and goes, first solution, it's a private customer. So the best solution can't apply. The buyer can't act as taxpayer in the country of destination. The seller doesn't send the good cross border. So seller can't surely know or can't know with certainty where the good ends up. So second best solution, the distance selling rules are also not applicable. So we end up with solution number three, selling that good is just taxed under German value at the tax here in the shop and nothing else ever happens. No, because you can't check where the goods end up and so on. So inland case is the last possible solution. Now we have, by the way, under this third rule, uh, taxation in the country of origin. Even if the good goes, let's say, to France, that means we have goods from taxed with a German VAT rate, which end up in a country where everything is taxed with a French rate. That might bring along a certain distortion of competition between suppliers of the two member states. So especially let's say let's have a look on germany and denmark a private customer from denmark if he or she goes to kiel or flensburg in the north of germany and buys there something at 90 percent and carries it home then they keep the 19 percent burden instead of the danish 25. 
Um, so buying in Germany is more favorable for them than buying in Denmark, in their home country. To keep that distortion rather limited, the EU agreed to set minimum tax rates uh, for the member states. EU law says in the VAT directive, there must be a minimum for the standard rate of VAT of 15% for all the member states, they must take 15% or more. At the moment, they all take more. Um, and even the reduced rates must at least be 5%. The VAT directive allows in regular cases to have one or two reduced rates in the member state, but each of them must at least be 5% if there is not a very special exception negotiated in the accession treaty of a country or something like that. Um, but the idea is that by this way, by the minimum tax rates, the distorting effects of solution number three on the competition are at least limited. Imagine what a catastrophe it would be for Denmark if Germany, closest neighbor, would be able to lower down its VAT rate to 1%. Probably all the Danish would spend half of their lives in um, making journeys to Kiel, Flensburg, Hamburg and buying goods there and carrying them home, that would not be tolerable. And that is why the minimum rates are necessary. Well, so let's sum up our three steps, our testing scheme for cross-border cases in the EU. Step number one, does the best solution apply? So is the buyer somebody who can read and write and knows about regular tax declarations? In that case, we declare the acquisition by the acquirer in the state of destination as a taxable transaction. You would call it inter-community acquisition and define it in 1A, USDG and 3D, the transaction and the place. And the deliverer would be taxable but tax-free in the country of origin if he brings proofs for what happens. If, however, the buyer is not competent, is not um, an expert or at least a half expert who has qualified or as taxpayer by exceeding the threshold or renouncing on it, then you would end up with a second best solution, distance selling rules. So in that case, the seller is declared taxable in the country of destination. So one one number one applies as usual, only modification 3C shifts the place to the other country. And if also that doesn't work, you have the default rule, the affair is taxable in the country of origin as always, no tax exemption, no modification, nothing. So that's how it works here and we are going to deal with these details of these rules more closely in the following chapters but that should be sufficient for today so thank you very much for listening goodbye and i hope to see you again soon on the channel